Hey, welcome to my session. Uh, my name is Ronan. I've uh, uh, been in the Drupal world for, uh, well, since about, two, well, not 2003, but about 2005, maybe. Um, I, I worked at a uh, web agency for, whatever that is, 12-ish years with Molly, right there. Uh, and uh, then I uh, built a thing that got bought by Pantheon, and I worked with them for eight years. So, as I just mentioned before the recording started, I haven't actually built a Drupal site professionally uh, in eight years. So, this might be more of a sort of a, hey, look at what cool thing I found, rather than a, like a how-to. <laughs> uh, it is untested. It is unproven. But I'm excited to, to test it and see if it actually is a good solution for, for local development. Um, so, local development. I presume this crowd, because you're here, you understand why this is an issue. It's, uh, is that pretty fair to say? Everybody here has had some issue trying to develop locally. Okay, getting some nods. Uh, we like developing locally. We, we, we like developers. We want speed. We want responsiveness. We don't want to wait around for a deployment every time we make a change. It just makes it harder to iterate. So we want it right on our computer. We spend a ton of money on these little things. I mean, they're really fast. And all, if all we do is email and use a web browser, we're wasting them. So we really want to be able to run locally. Um, SysOps don't get that, but... Uh, Tough luck. Um, but that's complicated, right? What we were just saying before we started, we used to do, there's, there's ways to do it. We sort of, oftentimes you end up stringing it together, stringing together your own little internal infrastructure on your laptop using some sort of package manager uh, or a, some sort of glorified set of scripts on top of a package manager, um, which kind of helps with dependency hell, but dependency hell will always be hell. Uh, once you upgrade your PHP, well now your MySQL won't be compatible, and once you update that, then your Drush no longer works, and when you get, you know, old, we have to deal with older versions of sites, because maybe you're a professional, you work on old sites, not just new stuff. Uh, yeah, they all play, don't play nicely together. Your laptop, at least traditionally, is not going to be the same architecture as your professional hosting uh, hardware. These days, with ARM, that's becoming less of an issue, but... Uh, even amongst, even within the same company, you're not going to have everybody on the same architecture as a local. Uh, it's just not realistic. Once you've been around long enough, the uh, the equipment starts to get old. Uh, and then uh, this also is getting better, uh, thanks to container-based hosting. But you, like, anybody remember putting a PHP info up so you can tell what the hell you're even hosting on? Like, what's installed? What version of what weird module? There's just so many pieces, and. None of us understand any of them. Like we, we're, we're lucky if we get ten. If we understand ten percent of PHP I and I, right? Like that would be an accomplishment. So, and the and the hosts don't get it either, right? Like people deploy those I and I files aren't quite sure. We had this problem. There we go. Yeah, I just fell asleep. Um, oh, because I'm not plugged into the one with the power. Uh, so yeah, as we've discussed, there have been solutions forever. This top row is your is your uh, Zamp, Mamp, Wamp line. Uh, and if anybody's, uh, who here has used any of the top row here? Got uh, more than half the room, maybe about half. So this is the old school way of doing it. It was like a native app that most of them, and I was more familiar with Mamp, uh, maybe a little Zamp once it got cross-platform, but uh, they were mostly, as I've said before, um, glorified packaging of scripts sitting on top of the native implementation of usually PHP, MySQL, Apache, uh, the other part, <laughs> uh, whatever one I missed, Linux, uh, except not Linux, because they were MAMP, ZAMP, and WAMP. Um, uh, so yeah, you were, they were good, they worked, they were kind of, gave you a one click, here's everything you need, but A, they weren't everything you needed. Usually complicated sites needed more than those four things. Uh, and B, yeah, Linux is not Windows XP. Like, they're not the same. You cannot test locally and deploy and expect it to work. Uh, the bottom row is more recent. Uh, they're all, I think, all, all container-based. They're much more closer to what I'm going to be talking about today, and I have very little experience with them. But the experience I do have isn't amazing, right? Like, it's usually coming in with, oh, we used this to set this up, but, you know, uh, it doesn't really work, and you have to know the secrets, and, like, you, there's, you know... It, there's a little jank there, too, and that's okay. Uh, but they are also effectively scripting on top of containers this time. Um, but they're, but, but then they're using a native implementation of the container engine, which is why you don't have the same, like you don't have the same native versus, uh, versus Linux issues, but, um, but they are also, you know, uh, uh, 
fairly complex. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't use any of these. You should use one of these more before you use the thing I'm about to show you, uh, because my thing's untested, and these aren't. So uh, I'd love to hear from you guys maybe at the end which of these you've used and which of these looks the best. And which of um, so, so yeah, I'd love to get feedback on like whether these really do work. Um, but there's also this new thing uh, called dev containers. Uh, who has heard of dev containers? Uh, two or three, four people. Have any of you used them? Hands-on experience? Yeah, OK. Impressed? Not impressed? Uh, confused. Confused? <laughs> yes, agree. Yeah. Confusing, but there's potential. That's what I thought. Um, so it's this Microsoft development. The only two products that support it are Microsoft products. So it, it's a Microsoft thing, uh, for what that's worth. Uh, but it is, like, very obviously containers for your local dev development. Now, I don't think this is a group I need to explain containers to. Everybody gets the concept of containers and yeah, yeah. So, like, very efficient virtual machines, basically. You don't really need to, it's not, it doesn't need to get more complicated than that. Like, everything's separated like a virtual machine, but you can create dozens of them because you're not taking up an entire, like, gigabyte of memory for each one. Um, so you can, se much more separation. There's just a standard thing showing that there's different layers and they're all separated from each other and it's all very nice. It's, that's the kind of diagram that's not really that helpful to explain containers. But, uh, um, but they are sort of a, like, they are the current state of, of the art for making sure two different kinds of people's code don't bash on each other. Um, and, and they're, you know, it's more, and it's efficient. So uh, this, it, all of this sort of, all of the bottom row of tools that I showed before, uh, they all use containers, far as I'm aware. Um, but they use them for the software that you're developing. That seems really like... Super makes sense, right? I'm developing a Node app. I've got a container that has JavaScript and Node or Python or Go or I'm doing embedded software and I've got CPP and all of these like low-end stuff installed in this container so that it can run. Uh, actually, that last example was probably a counter example, but it makes sense that you have, again, there is a Python app, so you have the Python runtime. Python's a big piece of code. You don't want that on your PHP app if you don't need it. Um, Dev containers are different because, yes, you're using the container to host the code that you're writing, so you know that you're writing for a platform that's fixed because it's a container, but so is your local environment. You're actually, if even if I'm doing it on a Mac, I'm using a Linux as my development environment, which is where it gets interesting, which is where you can now apply the same config as code, git, you know, uh, approval, all of the stuff you do for code, you can now apply it to your uh, your config, the, your, your, your local host config. All of the stuff you need to do to get running now can be part of the repo, which it already is with, you know, Lando and these other things. With, you know, uh, there's scripts and there's things, but in this case, it goes all the way down to the architecture level. Um, well, I Intel versus AMD is the, is the first point at the stack at which you, you separate. And again, like... Uh, that's not, that, even now we're hosting professionally on AMD, so it's like that even might not be an issue. Um, uh, so so it's, it, it takes advantage of, yeah, so here, hey, how does it work? Um, if anybody who knows, so it's uh, primarily VS Code is how I'm going to be showing it to you, and the two products that support it are VS Code and Code Spaces. Does anybody know, everybody knows what VS Code is, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's probably the most popular IDE out there right now, because it's free, uh, and quite good. Uh, and then code spaces, does everybody know what GitHub code spaces are? Yeah, so that's effectively hosted VS Code. Um, so you can develop right in GitHub, no local uh, necessary. You just change the code, it'll run, it's, it's hosted ID, it's very cool. And it works uh, because of how VS Code is built. It's a, it's a web app. It's built on Electron, um, which means they've separated the, U, the UX user experience from the processing, as we do with web apps. That's that's and how we usually build them. We have a server side that does the heavy lifting, and then we have a client side that makes it all pretty and, uh, and logical, um, or human logical. Um, so because of that, though this is not typically how desktop applications are written, uh, but because it's separated and because there's a clean interface based on TCP between those two sections, you can run the remote, you can run the back end of VS Code somewhere else. So all that's running on your laptop is basically the electron frame and all of the actual work, the file editing, the loading, the processing, it's all being done on the remote server, uh, which doesn't have to be remote. It could still be on your local. 
Obviously, if it's remote, it's going to be a little slower. Your every change goes across the wire, and then it comes back. But if it's on the same, it's just going from one container to the other, there's overhead, but it's not detrimental. So you're treating it like a, well, like a client-server situation, but it's all on the same host. And, uh, and what it means is, while you're, you're still using Mac or Windows, or well, you're using Linux on Linux, no one's going to stop you, and that still feels like a fairly native experience, but underneath it, your paths aren't getting translated all weird. When you say, this is the path on the server, it's not like, oh, but when I'm on my local, it's actually under users slash Ronan slash tests slash Drupal 8 slash, and there's all my projects. Nope. It's www. or var. www.html, whatever, wherever it would be on that particular host, that's where it is. Uh, you're running Linux. So um, it's demo time. Um, Good timing on that. Uh, so, so we'll just show. I'm going to show you a basic, really basic example of how that works, and I'm actually going to show you if it works in code spaces. Did I keep that? Yeah. So this is. I mean, you'll recognize it if you've ever used VS Code, but this is um, GitHub's uh, hosted IDE. Uh, this is a um, just an example of a demo project but it very importantly has a, a dev container specification so that if you open it in VS Code or Code Spaces, those tools, and, and hopefully in the future, other IDEs, ah, my browser did something unexpected. You're telling me. Um, I think the website did something unexpected. I think clicking that button was my intention all along. Oh, I'm not signed in. Well, geez. And that's gonna be like, of course it is. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Sorry. I've seen this reverse two-factor where the code goes into the phone. It's different. It shouldn't make it shouldn't make a difference security-wise, I don't think. But that's new. Um, okay. Yeah. So I actually started one up earlier, uh, and they take like two or three minutes to boot up. So I will hopefully be able to jump right into this one that's already started. And they shut them down after a few hours if you're not using it, because, you know, Microsoft's nice, but they're not a charity. <laughs> um, I've been seeing Microsoft a lot more than I was expecting in this session. But they're not who they used to be. Like, this product is very Microsoft. It's very complicated, it's very powerful, it's got no sex appeal. Uh, but, like, they really, they really are developer-focused uh, in a way that I don't think the others are anymore. Um, so, yeah. People can change. Um, so, so here's should be fairly familiar to anybody who's used VS Code and has had a uh, you know a project. Uh, it comes with your usual, primarily this super important, very complicated PHP script right here, and then um, what's uh, um, important. Oh, I, I was going to show you that my computer doesn't have PHP on it, but that wouldn't matter since you can tell that this is running on the web. So I won't show you that. But just know that I have not set this laptop up to run PHP or Python or JavaScript or any of the coding languages that I've been using over the last three months. Uh, they are all running containers. And I know which versions, and it's not the Mac version, and it's not the Brew version, and it's not under, there's not two versions in two different paths, both of which are USR slash bin slash local slash PHP slash five. Uh, no, it's like exactly how you would deploy it with proper DevOps. Um, and we can try it. We can give it a go. This is a, uh, let's see, how do we run this? We go over here, and then we can um, launch the application. And I believe, yeah, we don't have a browser here, but you can see this is the PHP info output um, being sent to, the, to, to standard out. Uh, so yeah, so it's pretty clear that PHP works. Uh, version 8.2.6, and yeah, they've got their own sort of flavor of Ubuntu running this, it seems like. Um, and it's fairly snappy. It kind of feels like developing, you know, locally. Uh, but obviously you need to be online all the time, so this isn't going to be a local development solution, but it could certainly be something that would help in a pinch or help with like, oh, I'm you know, doing contracting jobs and only going to, they each take an hour. I'm not going to spend two hours setting up my local. I can just pop one of these open, do the work, commit it, 
test it all within a browser. That could be very cool. Um, and even and this one, this is one of the things that really got me. I love a good debugger, a proper, actual, real, step-by-step -step debugger. Just blows var dump out of the water in terms of like being able to figure out what's going on. So if, if any of you have not tried a real debugger, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have for JavaScript now that they're in every uh, every browser. But if you haven't tried it for PHP or any of the backend languages, you like absolutely need to because the ability to um, just stop your code uh, while it's running, even on a server. You just stop your code and then see what your, oh, there are no variables in this script, so it's hard to expect the variables, but uh, yeah, we got a question. Can you take this thing and put it on the container on your local system? Yes, I will do that in the next demo. But, no, I can't, but VS Code can. Um, it's all built in, it's all very cool. Um, so yeah, so, for me, that's that's kind of like worth the price of admission. I don't know if other like the modern tools might be really good at that. The old ones weren't. Map, Zamp, and WAMP were not great for trying to get X debug set up. Uh, I don't know about Lando and those other ones. Maybe they're really easy. Maybe this is a solved problem now, and I'm not selling anybody anything. But for me, I never want to live in a var dump world again if I don't have to. Um, so that's that's the basics. I don't know if there's much more to show you. I had a couple of things on the slide that. Um, yeah, so PHP on a machine with no PHP. Well, that, I just did it on the web. So um, yeah, and then Xdebug right out of the box. So that was what that's that was that was the appeal to me on the very basic level uh, for this. But of course, that's a that's a demo. That's very much a uh, oh yeah. I can tell you the advantages too before I get on to uh, so 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 you know I talked through some of these things that I really liked. Uh, if again, there's no prerequisites to run code spaces. It's just a web browser. But if you want to run it locally. Other than a web browser, I suppose there's a web browser prerequisite. Um, the only things you need to download and install are VS Code and some kind of Docker engine. Probably Docker Desktop, if you'd less, unless you don't want to pay their fee or whatever, but that's what I'm going to use is Docker Desktop because it's easy. And uh, I'm not getting paid for this, so I don't have to pay them. Um, it's got IDE integration, which makes a big difference. It's you know like the, like the Xbug thing, right? You can't have a debugger without a debugger. You can't have a debugger that's just you know, back end. You need an interface to make that work. So full ID read integration with, you know, anytime you're going to put like code spell or or any of these sort of uh, quality of life um, developer tools, linters and compilers and whatever, uh, they'll all be integrated in the IDE. So there won't need to be this like set of commands and invocations and NPM scripts and like job runners that you have to do to to build it and bake it and deploy it and download the database and update the scripts and update the cert from production and get all the stuff that you have to do. It'll all be in your IDE and there'll be a button and there'll be an interface and there's like all the tasks within I within uh, VS Code, if you ever use tasks, well those can now interact with your Dockers, Docker containers. Um, it's, it's an automated setup. Once you have VS Code and Docker installed, you need to install uh, a, a an extension within VS Code, which is pretty much right there. You click a button. That's not a, a, a that's not a, a barrier to entry. And then when you open a res, a, 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 a um, repository, that word should not have been that hard to come up with. Um, it, uh, VS Code or uh, or or Cloud Spaces will just do the thing it needs to do. It'll fire up all of the all of the all of the um, backend containers, and it'll start talking to them. And it will know that you're on a remote. So it won't be like, hey, you know, your file endings don't match, and you're it's just, it just takes care of that, because it knows what you're doing. Um, unlike previous systems, now the, the new generation are all built on standards, this is an incredibly thin layer. There's very little special sauce here. This is Docker all the way down, or any container engine, doesn't have to be Docker brand. Um, VS Code, which is open source, and, but you know, um, and then the, the 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 specification is really simple. It's really open. I'm sure if this you know takes off, other IDEs and other developers will use it. It's not, it's not like there's nothing proprietary here. There's nothing that isn't like really just a coordinating layer. It's a, it's more like an agreement than a than a uh, like a technology. Um, it, it's self-hostable. Uh, either locally or you can do your own cl cloud thing. You can use code spaces, but you could build code spaces. Like Microsoft has released all of that software. You could just have your own running online Linode 
I've never set that up, but I can't imagine it's super challenging, especially since you know you can do it on your local house with one click. Um, uh, you get consistent consistency across your whole team, and that goes all the way through the stack, not just like oh well you know try to use the same version of Chrome. Like you can specify everything, every piece of software that needs to go into building your site or building your product. You can specify it specifically, and everybody can have it. So there won't be any more mystery, like, oh, which version are you on? Or, like, which version of MySQL does this need? It's like, well, nobody really specified. Containers are great, because you specify everything. It's config as co uh, code. You don't, there's, like, you can trace back all of the installs. You don't need to wonder what, what software is there um, waiting to bite you in the ass. And it's consistent with more modern hosts, which use containers to host. Uh, the... Um, the MAMP style was more like the old hosts where they would print a big old virtual machine with install Apache on there, install PHP on there, and hope to help those didn't conflict with each other. And then you might get some other things built in, but if you want to change any of that, if you want to install anything new, that would mean installing new software for thousands of other customers. You're not getting that happen. But nowadays, hosts are using containers, so if you can say, so you're more likely to be able to find a host who can host the container you designed, or be able to consult with you and say, look, here's how we host, here's the versions you need, and, and et cetera. You, you won't get the mystery meat of like, we don't know what PHP we use. That's Jim, he installed it last week. It's, it's, more, it's a more modern way to, to plan. Um, but, you know, hello world is all well and good. Uh, this was always the thing with, especially for like debugging examples. It was like, yeah, a three line code, a three line program doesn't need a debugger. Like, what happens when you're six layers deep with 14 libraries? Is it going to resolve correctly? Is it going to get you to the right spot? Are you going to be able to do anything about it? Uh, Drupal's complex, you know? Uh, there's a reason those first line all rhymed with LAMP. There's at least four pieces of software, and that's not where it ends anymore. We need so many more things, some of which are remote, some of which are live services, some of which are, you know, we just, like, it's a complex world to build a website, and this thing needs to handle 100% of it, because if you have one piece missing, you just can't, you know, I mean, not necessarily. You could probably be like, fine, I don't have to use Redis on my local, but it's hard to develop for Redis if you don't have it on your local. It's hard to develop for the final, for production, if you're not emulating production in some way. Um, but for all of these things, well, for most of these things, there's a, there's a, there's a catalog full of containers that somebody has, usually the team that wrote the software, has optimized. You want a good PHP container? Like, there's a bunch of them. And you can really specify, and you can specify your, your operating system, you can strip out everything you don't need. Uh, and, and you don't have to do the work. Other smarter people have done the work, or you can do your own. Um, so, like, being able to, it's like the store for, for these things, but you don't pay. Um, obviously, I'm selling you on containers now, which is pretty dumb, because everybody knows what they are and why they're great. But um, applying them to local software is what's uh, really, I think, really cool and different. Uh, disadvantages. Uh, there has to be some. Uh, I've just discovered this, so I don't really know what all the disadvantages are. I haven't tried to do this on a full project, like end-to-end. -end. I haven't tried to set up like a, a seven-year-old project on this and hope you could just slide it in and see what happens. We'll see. Um, but you know, performance, it's not 100% it's, it's not native. There's going to be a little bit of syncing. The, you know, Docker does pretty well nowadays with, with virtual volumes and stuff, sharing files, but it's not seamless. And you know, occasionally you'll hit refresh and you'll be like, why the hell is this all broken? And then five seconds later, ah, file hadn't quite synced. Uh, so you know, not perfect, not ideal. Um, but I haven't really done, used it enough. To, I, I haven't had any issues with the performance. I haven't used it enough to know whether that would be frustrating or not. Um, vendor lock-in. It's not, it's all open, uh, and like legitimately open, like they're not, they didn't just open the standard and then keep the software closed, it's all open. Um, but it's still, Microsoft's the only person, the only company supporting this in any real way right now. And even, uh, I think I put up some links to it. Um, yeah, containers.dev, this feels like a very sort of, um, I don't know who's behind that site. Uh, I think it's Microsoft, but it's, it's very, feels very uh, astroturfy, like the fake community behind an open source thing that's really just a company trying to make fetch happen. Um, but, you know, there is something out there. It's just, it's not a real community yet. Um, so, yeah, and it's, yeah, like, I already, I showed you six logos, and those are just the ones that had logos, right? Actually, one of those was fake. I don't know if you could spot which one it was. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, there's, a, there's half a dozen more out there that this room could name, I'm sure. So, do we need another one? Hey! I'm not going to advocate for yet another complex thing that's just going to make everybody hate me, but uh, maybe we do. 
maybe we need a 15 standard. Uh, sometimes you do. Sometimes that one does come along. I'm not like this. This 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 is a joke. Obviously, everybody knows this joke. But yeah, we need to keep doing that, right? Like the 15th one is sometimes the right one. I mean, 15 is a little high, but like if we were still on USB one, we wouldn't be real happy about it. So yeah, let's keep op op operating. So yeah, more demo. Um, so right, we're gonna try and do a full Drupal stack. That will be more complicated. I'm gonna do it locally this time, if it cooperates. You can see my screen here, and is this the right? Yeah, Drupal 10 dev container demo. So um, I'll close this up. This is my uh, this is my this is my my project. Uh, is this big enough? Should I? Yeah. There you go. Um, this is my project. Uh, I've set it up. So this is not a standard repository layout. I, and this won't be this be too long for the QA session. But I'd love to hear other people what they found for repository layouts, for what works and what's like really nice. But for what I did. Uh, is I put the Drupal source, this gets downloaded automatically, but I put it, I made it read only and separated it out so no one can accidentally hack a core. Uh, and then your custom modules and themes will get, uh, they're, they're symlinked into the directory so that your, your source, in their source directory is all the stuff your developer would be working on. Uh, this is the Drupal source code, which I have available here so that debugging and searching and references all still work, but you're not allowed to edit it because it's core. You kill a kitten, um, and then there's a folder where we can keep logs, database files, anything that you might want to see. Like, oh shit, is that actually working? Or like, oh, I want to delete that database altogether. Like, no need to bury it in a in a container somewhere, in a container volume somewhere where you have to like dig it out. You can just expose it right in there, um, including temp files, which I should probably just put in data. There's no need for another thing for that. Um, and I include some caches, so that some of the performance can be mitigated with, with, with caching. But uh, this, believe it or not, is a full Drupal site. And uh, if I, oh, it's running. So um, what I didn't show you was this. So this is the same repository. Um, this is where you really, you got to spend about a week getting your head around this. This is the same repository, but it's not running the dev containers. This is running purely on my local. So if I go here and if I try to um, if I try to run a task that's built in, that that's in here, um, so reset the environment that deletes everything. I'm not going to do it. Well, it's not going to work. But it'll say you don't have PHP. You can't run this task. That's a PHP script. What the hell are you talking about? This computer's never heard of PHP um, because this is my local. And the only thing I do on here is actually develop the dev container. And that's really confusing. When you're developing the dev container, you're working with Docker and containers, and you need all of those tools, and you need to be like rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding. But if you're working on Drupal, you want to really stop fussing with the dev containers. Just don't touch them. You're just going to make life harder. So that's what that's me. For, that's a discipline thing for me. So what I did was in the VS Code settings, I just hid, I just hid the extra stuff. So if you've got a junior developer or somebody, or if you just want focus mode, you take away all of the dot, like the, the, those hidden folders. I just, I just actually just hid all hid, hid, hidden files, uh, which might be a little brutal for this. <laughs> but, uh, but like that's a cleaner, you know, this could be just source, and it works. And then your DevOps team would be the only ones who care about what's in the dot folders uh, if you've got a big team. Or your, if your DevOps team is you on Tuesday when you're focusing on that. Um, so so um, so that was that. So this is the version that's running on Linux. So it's very hard to tell the difference. Same exact um, repo, same piece of software, two different windows, and uh, a couple of differences are um, I don't have Git. I mean, I have it running, but I don't have it set up properly on my local. Don't need it because I can just commit right from the the container. Uh, and oh, you can't. Even, you guys can't even see the main difference because it's right here. If you guys have ever used remote, um, the remote feature of VS Code, uh, that's what it uses to, con to, to communicate with the dev container. So it uses this little blue bar that shows up whenever you're in the at sign or saying it's 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 not local. You are communicating over the wire to some other machine that happens to be local. It might, it, it might not be. In this case, it is. So that's, you know, I, I kind of think they should have a bit different indicator because if you're jumping in and out, like maybe theme the thing so it's like purple or something. I don't know. Um, but 
but if you but but it's but as soon as you open this, um, you'll get a little dialogue that says, "This is a dev container. Uh, do you want to run it? Do you want to launch that?" And you can say, "No, I'm working on the actual code here," <laughs> or you could say, "Yeah, um, if you do, I'm not going to do it because it'll just um, build the thing again." Um, you'll get it. It'll it'll boot up the it'll boot up the containers, um, which I will show you in Docker Desktop. Here they are. It's not just one container, because that's not a great way to build Drupal. Uh, it's one for Nginx. I didn't use Apache. I hate, I hate HD access. I just hate it. I, I spent like two days trying to get Apache to work, and I was like, why? I didn't like it then, and I don't like it now. Um, Drupal 10, that's just a PHP, the exact right version of PHP for that exact right version of Drupal. And nothing else needs to be compatible with that version of PHP, not Drush, not any of your scripts. Only Drupal's running on that. And if you need to change it, only Drupal needs to be tested. Um, PHP my admin can't live without that. Um, an actual database, uh, and then I throw it through a site speed. I don't know if anybody's used sitespeed.io. It's a little Docker container that just does a, like a sequence of tests on your site. It's kind of awesome. It's really easy to use, and it's just one of these things where you could just throw it into your list of containers. You could have Redis, you could have Solar, you could have anything you can run. You can put it in there, and it will be legitimately like. Two lines to, to, to integrate it. You, for the most part, the integration here is, is zero because if you use default MySQL passwords and default URLs and default things, it's all very secure. It's on, only on your local, um, but you don't need to configure it. You don't need to set the password here and then 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 here. It just it'll all talk to each other on the same little local network, um, and the results look quite a bit like a, um, a Drupal site. If I go to localhost. Uh, nope. <laughs> Way to go, Edge. See, I'm trying to give Microsoft the uh, the credit here, so I'm using Edge. I was going to also make my slide deck in Office, but I didn't have time to learn Office. <laughs> um, so I learned Edge instead. So so in my local, I, uh, I can oh, for God's sake. <laughs> See, I don't recommend this yet. Um, can I start a plane scaler? I, I did not touch that YAML file, so I suspect we've got a, a file syncing issue. I can also show you file not found. Well then. This is great. Um, I can show you what it looks like to rebuild the container, uh, which is what you do when things... Actually, actually, a little trick. If you're going to be working on this, a little trick. If things get weird, which they will, just delete everything out of Docker. Um, there's a Drupal site. Um, Docker just gets confused sometimes, um, especially with this, where I'm not doing a good job of naming things differently. So it'll be like, what do you mean you have three containers named Drupal? And I was like, well, sorry. Um, so yeah, this is the minimal install. Um, you, you guys aren't super impressed with a, with a Drupal site, I'm sure. But um, maybe if I show you uh, what it would take to reset everything back to zero, which that works. Yeah. Now we're back to a clean, uninstalled site, and uh, I'll need to choose a profile and a language because this repo doesn't know what I want. But um, and I'm going to do minimal because I don't want to wait through the install for the umami. Um, but that's it. That should be it. That's like I don't need to put in credentials. I don't need to set up file systems and stuff because that's all just built into this. Like it's all it's always going to be user pass localhost. So we're not talking we're not talking to real secure systems. It's all localized. Um probably don't need to you probably don't need to watch me build a Drupal site. Um but the other the other and, and for most of us, I, I don't know when the last time I ran the installer was. I think I probably ran it three times in the twelve years I built Drupal sites because it's just not like we were just, we would just copy the one that worked and modify from there, right? Like it's maybe that's not the best way to do it, but it's definitely quite quicker. And even if even if you, if you build fifteen sites a year, you're still not going to hit this page fifteen times. So um, more likely, we're going to want to restore from backup, and that's uh, I'm not going to demo that because that's slow. But you can envision how this could be very easily integrated, either an install profile that pulls from backup or um, a drop folder. Drop it back up into a folder, automatically pulls it, boots up the Drupal site. That feels pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I was going to put into this demo, but I did take notes. So, 
More demo. Multiple containers for full drop stack. So that is, I, I will move on because I was being a bit wandery there. Um, uh, but that's but but that shows you you can build you can you can run something as complex as Drupal, um, and and you can add things. So so, so the things I didn't get to because I started I built this demo yesterday and it wasn't as long a day as I thought it was going to be. Um, Twenty four hours. <laughs> um, I swear I thought it was thirty. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, what I just said, file watcher, uh, which is you just get an extension of VS Code that watches your files. VS Code has a file watcher in it, and then just like a Drush call or or, or even just a MySQL, my MariaDB client call. Like that's one line of code, and now you have a thing that when you drop a, a SQL file in a folder, it'll, it'll boot up the website for you, um, or you know, enter the URL and it'll go talk to backup and migrate on the server. Uh, putting in something like the Elk stack or um, trying to think of the alternatives for that, but something that'll let you do better log analysis than just, what the hell's happening? I don't know, where are the logs? Um, have them go all through through some sort of proper logging thing with searching and filtering and alerting, like, oh, what's going on? Oh, my, my SQL just died. Why? Let's go look. Um, mail handling. Ah! Like, mail handling, or PII in general. Like, it used to just be, oh, oh I accidentally sent 10,000 emails from my local host. Um, but now we're like now it's all PII. We shouldn't be touching it. It shouldn't be on our local hosts. It should be the transfer of PII should be handled automatically and not up to the responsibility of each individual developer. You can only really handle that when you've got something like this, which is a sort of easy standards to implement. Um, uh, and then you can add a, like a like a proper piece of software that archives the mail and shows you what got sent, rather than just dumping it, like just losing it. Um, and then the site speed IO thing, I was going to demo that, but I recommend you check out site speed IO in your own time. Um, although, you know, demoing it, it just runs. You just just run it, and it's, now it's all on the, off to the races, checking out that new website. Uh, it's not fully installed, so I don't know it's going to be a successful check, but this is the sort of tool where that could have spent a day setting this up, and I'm not going to bother on a small thing. But if it's just there, if it, all, it runs automatically when I, when I launch the thing, and then it creates a report, and I can go see what my speed is. Now, when I launch the thing, it's still installing, so the report is a bit premature. You have to run it. So, like, you know, there's got to be some way to run it on every change or, you know, some other thing uh, like that or every commit. But these are the kind of things that, that you wouldn't take the time to do unless, you know, you were able to pay it off over multiple projects. Or, it, like, in this case, it took me about three minutes because all I had to do was um, basically show you the entirety of that code if you're interested, uh, it's in uh, Docker Compose, um, which is the thing that lets you run multiple containers, and that's it. This is all I have to do to get this to get this to work. Um, I just have to say I want this image, this already built, nicely tuned image. Uh, it needs to talk to the, to the Nginx, uh, uh, so I'm giving it a link so that it can talk to Nginx internally. And then it also, I'm mapping the name Nginx to the name Drupal so that when I say, um, when I actually give the command to, when I give the URL to check, it kind of makes more sense than just saying localhost or giving an IP. You can, you can just map that name and now that's, to this container, that's the address. And, uh, and it's outputting it to the data folder I mentioned. And, uh, and this was kind of like, I like this because it was an example of something you could add for basically nothing. And that could be, and this is one thing, I'm just talking about this, but uh, there are lots of these things that are just like provided by other people. You just click a box and all of a sudden, ooh, I've got Ant installed. Ooh, I've got, I don't want any of these things, but <laughs> some of them maybe. Um, you know, if you need GitHub on your container, or GitHub, you need Git on your container. You can't really do much without Git. Well, you got to install it on the container. Uh, it's not hard. I think I probably have it on this one. I uh, don't need to do it. But yeah, so um, it's very easy to expand. And because you're using very well-tested containers, it seems to mostly work, um, which is cool. And that is all of the content I have created, which I think is good, good-ish timing, because I want any questions. But I also want to hear from you guys. Like I like. I don't know the answer to your questions because I just discovered this. I'm just learning this now. But I'd love to hear your reactions to this, where that looks exciting to those people who are doing this work. And 
Yeah, anybody have any questions? Is there any way you can automate taking a production site, bringing it down and putting it into a container? That is my plan, yeah. Like, well, like that's next step. So right now, um, the closest we have is, you know, you grab a database backup and you throw it in there. Um, I, you know, I developed backup and migrate. I, so I've thought a lot for the last 15 years about backup. So, like, there's a flow, data goes down, code goes up, files, don't touch them. Um, so, so probably if I go extend this, I will extend it using something like backup and migrate, but it doesn't really even need that. Like, a, like Drush works, so that's where, yeah, like... Well, even beyond that, just taking the PHP and the Nginx and all this other stuff. Is just pulling it, yeah. Well, so there's a few things that we can do. Um, if you're hosting on some, somewhere that uses containers, somewhere like Pantheon, somewhere like a modern host, you could re reproduce almost the exact package locally. So like, like if you point this tool, now this is not done, this is a future feature. If you point this tool at your hosted website, it could say, ah, you're hosting on Acquia. This is the package, this is the set of versions that they're currently using. So here's your particular, your, your particular setup, and then we go, we log into your account, we pull your database, and we pull your files. We don't need the code, probably. We need the custom code, but we don't need all the modules. Yeah. Those are all available on Drupal.org. So yeah, I think pull it, like that's legitimately, the interface I want to see is when you pull up VS Code on a project for the first time, you see, a, you either get a script or a little thing that says, what's the URL of your website? And when you put that in, it goes and it finds out how can we access this site? Does it have Backbone Migrate installed? Is it on one of the hosts we recognize? You know, give us an FTP server. Give us your MySQL credentials. Give us some way to access the data. And then from then on, like the drag and drop, like we detect what it is, we pull it in, we spoot it up. So that's what I would want for like be able to bootstrap a really new developer. So you don't uh, have to learn how to install Drupal to learn how to program Drupal. Um, but an even better use case might be something like Codespaces where you don't have to even download anything, you just click it, poop, comes up in a new tab. Yeah? So how much configuration did you do? I feel like yeah. you just skipped over. Yeah, 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 the, the, I, the, the rest of the effing owl, right? Um, I don't know if anybody gets that meme or if I just sounded crazy. Um, yeah, like quite, quite a bit, um, and I'll show you some of it, uh, but quite a bit because I was exploring, right? Quite a bit because I didn't know what I was doing, and some of this is wrong. Some of this is overkill. I found a lot of things I was doing, and I was like, oh, wait, that's built in. Take it all away. Um, but, but generally, like, so this folder is, is, is everything. This folder is just because I was a little lazy. Um, all of these things should be part of the dev container, because what this means is that when you launch uh, a project, you're also configuring the IDE. So you're configuring the spell checker, you're configuring the linters, you're configuring maybe, I mean, you don't want to be aggressive, you don't want to be like, you have to use this theme now. Some people like different themes. But like, you can be opinionated as a tech lead as to what tools that your, your fellow engineers are going to use um, by putting them in the container. Now, this, either way, either place is a place to put these VS Code customizations. So here's where I put the, the, um, the task to, to, to de delete the database and reset for install. Yeah, simple enough, and uh, it's, a little, it's a little shell script. Um, so this is all of the configuration. It's quite a few files, uh, but some of them are things like this, right? This is the PHP INI. I had to override something because I was doing something that needed a big upload or something. I don't know. Something broke. I need to fix it. Wait, I've got a file where I can put my exact overrides. I don't have to go hunting around the system. It's right there. Uh, and in fact, this is like the entirety of the PHP INI file. Everything else is default. There's no mystery underneath. There's no like... Oh, and it cascades with seven other things because all of these tools are built in the like late 90s where shared computing was a thing. So they're all like, oh, first we check your home directory. Then we check the root of the website. Then we go down each path. And it's like, just, just don't. No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to change. This is a production website. We don't need you searching the whole, the whole database for new, for new uh, instructions. Um, so this is, it's pretty short. I'm sure in a real version you would need to specify more things than a memory limit. The defaults have worked for me so far. Um, same with, you know, my configura the configuration for my, my, my SQL. And most of this stuff is totally not necessary. I just wanted to expose the logs. I just wanted to see them in my, in, on my local. Otherwise, they would just, that all would just get logged into the, into the container and you'd never see it. You could go look for it. But uh, that's all this is, is really just me taking the data out and putting it somewhere I control. Um, you guys might recognize this. Um, the vast majority of the work is going to be in uh, the dev container 
JSON file, which specifies this is, you know, this is the configuration where you say, what container do I want? And in this case, I want a whole suite of containers. So I'm using a compose file. Um, and, then, uh, and then you tell it what to do once that boots up. So I reset every time I rebuild. That seems kind of cool, like, you know, uh, cattle, not pets. Um, just, you know, be able to push a button and you're back to live, back to production again. Um, I, yeah, again, I hit all the hidden stuff. Uh, and most of this is totally unnecessary. This is just me tuning to my, this is why it took me so long. I was just fiddling. Um, and then the extensions that are useful for PHP development or Drupal development specifically, you don't have to teach people which ones to install. You don't have to give them instructions. They're just going to download. You know, if you if you decide you want to do something weird with uh, well, spell checker, so nothing, there's nothing weird in here. Oh, log file highlighter, right? That's not default. I don't think it worked well, <laughs> very well, but like I was able to test it out. And if it had been brilliant, I could have deployed it to every one of my engineers. The next time they did an update, it would be available now to them, probably as a new um, a new tab on my little like intro page. Uh, I created this little um, this little index, just literally just HTML page, because each of these is a separate little web server. I'm not going to be remembering all these ports. Um, the other thing I want to add is MDNS so that they all have names. No more ports. So you'll be like, Drupal.local, MySQL.local. That'd be nice. Um, you were asking about configuration. Yeah, this is it. Uh, then there's a few things like your know, local settings override file. This is kind of probably standard stuff to anybody who's done any development. It's like, oh, we need to override with the local credentials, local database credentials, real secure. Uh, root, root. Um, but it's really nice to be able to be root all the time. Just work at root. Like, like I don't need security on this laptop unless uh, if if I leave it on the bus and somebody cracks the, the the fingerprint reader, they might get test data. I don't care. So the fact that I don't have to treat this like a production site just because some of it is, I really like. But also, you could do this in production because only your PHP server needs to talk to this thing. That doesn't need to be separated. Like that's this that's the old school way of doing things. Like you've got ways to, to secure this this bundle that aren't literally MySQL's very half-assed uh, password security. Um, and then that's the welcome. It's just my, my little page with the with the link. So it's it's you know it took a while, but there's not very much here when all is said and done. Uh, and the reset script looks just like a shell script where I just basically delete some files. Um, I, 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 you know, I link the, the sources into the right spot, I, you know, the, basically reset it for, 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 for reinstall. Um, so that's, so, so yeah, uh, it, the minimum amount is basically one or two lines of code. But with that, you're only going to get like a default Python script thing or default Python, which is, which is great for like doing a quick script. Just, yeah, it's super quick. In fact, if you just, if you want to, um, Try, you know, if you do this, you, it's like you just literally like push one of those, and you've got you can work in any of these languages. Uh, these are the ones that they've got built in, and of course, other people have built other ones. I've even made my own for for doing Arduino work. Um, any other questions? Any other suggestions? Anybody feeding back? Yeah, you. So you just put in your rush command to create your site, and you'll love way through all the monkey business. Like yeah, yeah. I was having a hard time getting brush to work. Um, but one of the things I did to solve that problem, which I really like, so yeah, ultimately, yeah, like that, like Drush would be a big part of it to be able to spin up, restore, or like, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm focusing heavily on a developer audience would rather use Drush or a, or a site builder audience would rather use a, a, like an install profile, but there should be, they, we can accommodate both for sure. Um, but one of the things I, I did, which I really thought was cool, was I was able to run Drush on a different container than the web server. So... A, a drush doesn't need to be in the package that's going to get deployed. But B, if there's a version conflict, which there is if you're working with older versions of Drupal, there are versions of Drupal and Backdrop that you just can't run combinations without, you know, you just get into a big mess. You can run them on two different versions. I'm not endorsing that because I don't know what that's going to break. But it worked for me um, <laughs> because drush doesn't care what the site runs. Drush just reads the stuff like itself. Drush just ends around the site in a lot of ways. So yeah, so, the, so, so to be able to run Drush or any other tool um, 
but as a separate container with separate, uh, and so in this case, you see, I'm not really specifying my, my, my um, not specifying past major versions, but you would if you were cared about consistency, you would probably say, I'm not just going to take whatever the latest version of Drupal is. We want to know when that's getting updated. But uh, I don't have a Drush container in here now. Actually, no, I do. I do, because the dev container itself is the one. There's all of these containers that run the software I built, and then dev container runs VS Code's backend. And that's where Drush is installed. Mostly the way they talk about dev containers is just one, and it's like it's your local host, and you install all the software on there like you would in the old days. But I w would rather mimic a production environment with the things talking to each other separately. So that's why I set it up this way. If you're more of a fan of like just installing everything on one go, then you can absolutely, there are pre-built uh, Docker images out there that'll run Drupal like a charm. Just right out of the box. And anything that is needed to run VS Code, VS Code will install onto the Docker. One of the first things it does when it boots it up, if it's not one of their images that's already got it in, is they'll install their own extensions into that Docker image. So like makes it compatible. Not always gonna work, right? Like if you put a really weird exotic Docker image up there, they're gonna be like, I don't know how to deal with that operating system, but uh, for the most part it has been really slick. There's lots of options. This is my way of configuring this, but this this is not canonical, this is not like an obvious way that you can do just about anything, which is a blessing and a curse for a lot of technologies. So like, let's say you're moving from something from like DNAV to this, what what would you, of course that would mean you'd have to experience with that, but what would be the configuration or the pieces that you'd have to put together? It's a great question, yeah, and I don't know, right? Um, because I haven't used DDEV enough to know like what it gives you and what would need to be translated out. Um, my goal here is to be as automatic as possible. Like we're dealing with, I'm, I, like I don't think this is a good tool to build. Um, I think DDEV has got lots of different applications it supports, and a number of them do. And I don't think that's a good idea for something like this. Because now you're like, well, if it's WordPress, do this, and if it's Drupal 7, do this, and if it's Drupal 8, do this, and, if it's Drupal 8, and you're building another complex set of things. Just do the thing you need for this site and make it part of the site. You know, Make the configuration of your development part of the application, just like you do with DevOps. If you're doing DevOps or continuous delivery, you're adding that configuration into your, you know, your, your Circle CI folder or your GitHub Actions or whatever. You're integrating your DevOps into your code base. Integrate your local development into your code base. And because the only thing that, the, that your engineer is required to have is a computer that can run VS Code and Docker, which if they don't have that, they're not an engineer, right? You can't, like, I think everybody here probably has those pieces of software, at least to some degree. So. Um, it's okay, I think, to be opinionated. Not everyone's going to like VS Code, but at the same time, if you're going to settle on something, like, please don't make it NeoVim. You know, like, like let's not uh, let's not burden ourselves. VS Code is very accessible. It's free. It's it's pretty usable, and it has a ton of features and a lot of extensibility. So, and it's an open standard. So I think other IDEs will eventually pick it up, or the people will write plugins. Yeah. What extension did you need to uh, import into the VS Code? The only one that you have to actually, um, actually, not, you don't really need to do anything because as soon as VS Code opens the thing, it'll detect that you need uh, a, a, an extension and ask if you want to uh, install it. But it's called dev containers or development containers. Yeah, dev containers. It's, uh, it's got 20 million downloads, so I wouldn't say it's obscure, but... Uh, but it's not built in. It's it's still uh, experimental enough. It's a preview. It's experimental enough that that's not in the core yet. Just as an example of what you're saying, I just pulled up. I don't use VS Code, but I have it on my computer, mm -hmm. and it noticed I had DDEV on my computer, and it said, "Hey, do you want to install Dev containers?" Yeah. Okay. So translating from DDEV is something that Microsoft already thought of. So there you go. It's probably got because it does. Microsoft's got like built in. Uh, support for Gulp and all these other tools where it's like, okay, you've got a task runner, why don't we import your tasks? Oh, we're going to meet you where you're at, is kind of the, the, the VS Code philosophy, I think. And uh, I, I love that they have that, that they that they have that accounted for, because yeah, it would be fairly straightforward to write a translator, right? Assuming DDEV is 
reasonably sensible, there's going to be a list of specifications, there's going to be a handful of tasks. Uh, it's got configuration that can be read. So if anybody wanted to translate, like to migrate off of a, of a system, I mean, it's doable, but it's work. Um, obviously, this would be easier if you started from scratch with this, but that's not very realistic. Which is why I like the idea of detecting from the actual site. What are you actually running on? What are you, what's, what's working now? <laughs> and then we'll, we'll move from there. We'll adopt from there. Uh, we're at time. Anybody have any more questions? I'm, I'll stick around if, there's, uh, if people want to dig into something, anything that's more integrated. But thank you for, uh, for coming. And